Good afternoon. My name is Aletta. Anybody tempted to say, what did you say your name was? Anybody here have a name like that where when you meet people, you have to repeat your name? One of those names where when you introduce yourself, people turn their heads as if to say, are you sure? <laughs> I've spent most of my life, I have a long history of, of explaining my name. When I was in kindergarten, my teacher told me I was mispronouncing my name. She said, you know, there's one T, so it should be Alita. And um, I spent a while convincing her that I was really pretty sure that it was Aletta. When I, and I am, it is, it really is. When I taught at, at American University here in DC, um, I, we all called our professors by, the first, by their first names, but I always had a couple students every semester who wanted to call me Professor Margolis. And I kind of thought, that was strange, all right, whatever. And I finally figured out what it was, was they were afraid to pronounce my, my first name. So they just stuck with being safe. You know, oh, Professor Margolis, good to see you. So that's, that's how they handled that. Um, and when I met my husband, and we've been married 17 years now, he thought I was joking. And he made me show him my driver's license to show him what my name really was. So uh, you know that, that Johnny Cash song, A Boy Named Sue, where the father names the boy Sue so he'll learn to fight for himself? I feel like, you know, my parents named me Aletta, and I know how to stand up for myself. So I really do. I, I know what it's like to be, to be unusual, to be the not normal one, to be the exception. Right? And, and the word exceptional really just means different. And as in the case of my name, it just means something different. But it can also mean, as we've already seen today and will continue to see, it can also describe people who do remarkable kinds of things. We've already heard about a number of them. I'll tell you about a few more. Think of the Olympic athletes that we're watching this week. Their, their, their courage, their strength, their talent, their precision, their discipline really makes them exceptional. Think of historical figures, someone like Martin Luther King whose passion and vision actually changed human history. Think about someone like Albert Einstein, whose ability to think differently changed our understanding of the universe. These people are, are truly exceptional, but, but they're exceptions, right? And few of us would consider ourselves to be like these people, right? Few of us would place ourselves among their ranks. We, we believe the conventional wisdom is that, that there are few people in this world who get to be great who get to be the change makers. They, they break the records and they pave the way so that the rest of us can get by. But, but, but we don't really believe that all of us could be that great. That just doesn't seem to make sense. And I've come to believe that the basis for this understanding that, you know, there are a few exceptional people, but that's not really for me. I believe that that, 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 that understanding starts in the bedrock of our society, in the American school system. Think about it. The American school system from pre-K through college educates 70, 75 million children, or 75 million students every year. Okay, you can't base a big system like that on the exceptions, on the outliers, so the wisdom goes. Right? What our, what our education system is designed to do, really and truly, is bring us all up to average. That's what it's for. But what if, as Bill Drayton, Ashoka founder, boldly asserts, there is something exceptional within each of us. My first job out of college, I, I'm a th third generation Washington DC native. And I came back to DC and where I still live and I ran an after school program for high school students in the juvenile justice system. And um, it was a playwriting program and my students were very interested in archaeology. So I brought in an archaeologist to speak with them um, about the science of archaeology and, and the kids decided to set their play. They were creating a play. They set their play in Washington DC in the year 3000, after the city had been destroyed. And so here they are, excavating this mound and pulling up these really interesting artifacts. And they find this, um, this green rectangular paper with president's faces and numbers on it. And they, they wonder what that might be. So they set it aside. And then they, they dig a little more and they find these um, plastic bags with white powder inside of them. What could those be? This was in 1989 at the height of the crack cocaine epidemic here in DC. So they find this, this powdery stuff. I don't know, what is it? And then they keep digging and they find this um, metal thing with a barrel and a trigger and some bullets and, and what might this be? They put it to the side. And then they find the diary of an 18 year old boy telling about his life and his day to day. And um, they read it and they look, look and learn about his life. And on the last page, because the end is missing, the end has disintegrated. On the last page, 
he's mad at someone who's insulted his girlfriend, and he's taking the gun to go and find that other kid. And then, of course, because you know, these kids are wonderful playwrights, the end, of the, the end of the diary is missing, right? So what do the characters do? Well, naturally, they build a time machine to go back to 1989 and find out what happened. So they go back, and they, they find out what the money is, and they find out about the crack, and they find out what the gun was, and they meet the boy's mother. And she's very upset. She's distraught because she hasn't seen him in three days. He's gone. So they set off in search of the boy. Can we find him? Can we see what's going on? And they decided to take that part of the play and leave it unresolved. They said, you know what? If we find him and everything's OK, it's not real. It doesn't happen that way. But if we find him and, and he's dead, well, then there's no hope. And we can't end our play that way either. So they ended that portion of the play unresolved, took the time machine back to the year 3000, and held a panel with the audience. And the audience was comprised of community leaders, city council members, at least one family member from each child's family. And they held a panel on what could have been done back in 1989 to save Washington, DC. These are kids in the juvenile justice system. Many of the students were reading and writing at a third grade level when they started in this program. But you know what happened? They started reading and writing and trying really hard and helping each other to write the play because they had something so important to say. And they had an opportunity to use their voices and to do work that was important and to be exceptional. And so that experience helped me learn that, well, maybe we all actually have something exceptional in us. And I thought to myself, if these young people had had teachers who had assumed that they were exceptional, I bet you they wouldn't have been in, this in the juvenile justice system in the first place. And that was the experience that convinced me to become a teacher. So I went to grad school. I got my teaching degree. I taught middle school. I taught elementary school. And I taught college. Um, and I loved teaching, but I decided that what I really wanted to do was work with teachers to help them rethink their role and help them develop a deep appreciation of the potential of every child. So speaking of teachers, do you ever, do you ever imagine, do you ever think, what do you think that Barack Obama's fourth grade teacher thinks now? Right? When she thinks back, like, oh my gosh, I had this kid in my class. Right? So she thinks back on how she treated him. Right? Do you ever think she sent him to the principal's office for making wisecracks? Right? Or you think that she ever rolled, his, rolled her eyes when he asked some question from out of left field? Right? Here's how I like to imagine it. She's, uh, she's given out a worksheet to the, to the class. Right? And they have to do a writing assignment. And they can choose. There's three things on the worksheet. You can choose uh, what I did over my summer vacation. A uh, funny thing that my pet did, or my favorite dessert. Okay, And young Barack comes up to his teacher and he says, could I write about something else? I'd like to write my essay on the stock market. Okay, Can you, oh my gosh, can you imagine that teacher if she had only known, right? Instead of saying, well, no, you've got to pick one of the items on the worksheet here, right? She would have said, please write your essay on the stock market. Please, we need you to write your essay on the stock market because we need you to know as much as you possibly can about the economy. Because you're going to do something, right? You're going to do something really important with that information later on in life. Because you are going to be someone important, someone exceptional. Well, what if every teacher taught every child with the belief, because the teacher, had, as if she had a crystal ball and looked into the future, right? taught every child with the belief that that child was going to be someone exceptional, someone important someday. What if, and this is crazy, right? What if we divine, designed our whole school system around the belief that every one of us has the potential to be an Albert Einstein, or Martin Luther King, or Barack Obama? What's the worst thing that would happen? Would we, would we forget to teach kids the alphabet? Will we forget to teach the times tables? I don't think we would. And what price are we paying when we don't set up our education around system around the belief that children are exceptional? I'll tell you a story of my education when I was in second grade, seven years old. I used to love math. I used to love mathematics. Then I, you know, went to school and had math class. But I used to love mathematics, right? So I made this discovery one day. I was thinking about stuff, and I said, Ms. Nelson, my second grade teacher, I've got to tell you something. Listen to this. If you add, and this is true, by the way, if you add two even numbers, any two even numbers, 2 plus 6 
100 plus 400, you will always get an even number. Pretty exciting, right? If you add two odd numbers, you will also always get an even number for your answer. But, but, if you add one even and one odd, you'll get an odd number. So this was really cool when you're seven. I figured it out, I went up to Miss Nelson, I said, guess what? And I told her what I figured out. And she said, well, yeah, everybody knows that. It's right here in the book, have a seat. Right? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's exactly what happened, right? Um, has it ever happened to any of you? you? You thought you figured out something really cool only to learn that, you know what, thanks, we already know that, right? Now look, I'm not, here's the thing, I'm not saying that we should lie to children, right? I'm not saying my teacher should have run down to the principal's office with, with me and said, call the newspapers, Aletta or Alita has made a world shattering, you know, an earth shattering discovery and, and we need to tell everybody. No, but what I am saying is that children's discoveries should be celebrated, whether they're new or not. Children's ability to invent, to come up with ideas, should be supported and should be the purpose of school. Um, and, and, and when they're not, we're risking an awful lot. There was a wonderful sketch that I saw recently um, by Wanda Sykes, you know, the comedian Wanda Sykes. She, she talked about our educational system. And she said, um, we, we, we treat kids, we treat students, actually, kids, whether they're in seventh grade or seniors in college, right? We often treat kids like their brain is an etch-a-sketch. You know, the etch-a-sketch is the wonderful rectangular toy with the red frame, and you turn the knobs, and you fill it up with all sorts of drawings, and then shake it, and it's blank again. She said, we teach, we teach kids this way, right? You cram all this information in. You learn everything you need to know, you hold on to it for a little while, you take the test and then ready for the next subject, right? And she's right, and she's right. So what if instead of treating kids like their brains are etch-a-sketches, what if we based our education system on the kind of work that we just saw in Kieran's video? This idea that young people, again, whether they're little kids or seniors in college or graduate students, that young people can come up with ideas not just to write down for the teacher to read, but that can actually transform communities. What if we ask teachers, instead of being information providers who fill up our etch-a-sketches, what if we ask teachers instead to be instigators of thought? And what if we treated kids not as empty heads to fill up, but as the owners of powerful minds who need to learn to use those minds well. Let me give you an example. In my work at Center for Inspired Teaching, we do, we train teachers to be instigators of thought, and we've been doing this for 15 years. And now we are in the planning process for opening a demonstration school that includes among its academic goals for students, imagination among the academic goals, imagination. And we spend a lot of time debating how in the world do you define that, that word? Well, here's what we came up with, four things. All right, imagination, number one. Imagination is the courage to create. Think back to the students I described in my playwriting course, the courage to create. Number two, imagination is a joyful spirit. Think about it, if kids came to school excited to be there, with a joyful spirit, how much more would they learn? Number three, the ability to generate ideas and devise solutions. Think about when I was in second grade and I figured out those discoveries about odd and even numbers. And number four, the ability to play, which is such an important skill as any social entrepreneur knows. Can you imagine if we had all gone to schools where imagination was among the academic goals, what might we be like today? I love to think about it. So 15 years ago, I took a chance. I left the classroom and I started Center for Inspired Teaching, started training teachers, investing in teachers so they could become instigators of thought, believing that by doing this, it might make real change for young people and for all of us. And it has and it's starting to spread. So I will leave you with a question to consider. What's the worst thing that could happen if you, whether you're a teacher or a student or not, whoever you are, what's the worst thing that could happen if you go through the rest of your life treating everyone you meet as if that person just might be exceptionally creative or exceptionally intelligent or exceptionally wise? 
Well, I'll tell you, sometimes you'll be disappointed. That's the chance that you'll take. But when you consider the upside, the fact that you just might change someone's life, including your own, it's a chance we should all be willing to take. So be the exception. Thank you.